right, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the final step in cellular respiration, which is... Now, just to do a recap of the previous sessions, uh, we have glycolysis. Remember, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. Glycolysis is a process in which starts the breakdown of glucose. However, it's incomplete breakdown. Okay, so how uh, it basically just splits glucose into two, uh, three carbon molecules. Remember, glucose is a six carbon molecule. During that process, some NADH is made. So remember, we have that NADH or NAD, which is an electron carrier. And then, of course, some ATP is made by substrate-level phosphorylation. Then, uh, if oxygen is present, the pyruvate is going to enter the mitochondrion and then become oxidized. So uh, pyruvate oxidation is basically like an intermediate step in between glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. Now, once pruvate is oxidized, it's oxidized to acetyl-CoA, and during this process, some carbon dioxide is released, and the acetyl-CoA then enters the citric acid cycle. Now, remember, there's two pruvates from glycolysis, then there'll be two acetyl-CoAs, so both acetyl-CoAs must enter the citric acid cycle in order to completely break down one glucose molecule. So during the process of citric acid cycle, there is, um, well, two cycles, we'll assume. Um, there is six NADHs that are made, and there are two FADH2s that are made, and then two ATPs that are made by substrate-level phosphorylation. Now we're going to talk about oxidative phosphorylation. Um, you were introduced to the difference between substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation early on in this chapter. Just to do a quick recap, remember substrate level phosphorylation involves the use of an enzyme to transfer a phosphate from an organic molecule to ADP to make ATP. Well, oxidative phosphorylation involves the transfer of an inorganic phosphate to ADP to make ATP. And it's this step that makes the majority of the ATP. It's about 90% of the ATP. This step has two phases. The first phase is the electron transport chain or electron transport. And the second phase is... Now, um, chemiosmosis actually couples the transport of electrons to the synthesis of ATP. So we're going to see how that works. All right, so uh, let's talk about electron transport first. So electron transport occurs in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion within the cristae. So remember the cristae are basically those foldings in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion which increase surface area. Well this increased surface area makes a, a greater uh, potential to make more ATP because in this inner membrane there's more of the proteins and enzymes that are required to make ATP. So if there's more of those, there's more potential for ATP. Now again, it's mostly uh, complexes that are embedded in the inner membrane. Some of them uh, kind of are static, some of them kind of can move around. Now they're uh, complexes which involve many, many proteins, and they include uh, what's called cytochrome proteins. Cytochrome proteins have uh, metal cofactors which allow for the transport of the electrons between the different cytochromes in the protein complexes. Now, NADH and FADH2, remember, those come from a couple different processes, okay? So they come from uh, glycolysis. They come from uh, 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 citric acid cycle. They come from the pyruvate oxidation. Okay, so we have NADH and FADH2. These are the electron carriers. These are electron carriers which are carrying the electrons. They're going to drop them off at the multi-protein complexes within the electron transport chain. And then what happens is uh, the electrons are going to start out at a higher free energy as they're passed through the multi-protein complexes within the electron transport chain, they drop in free energy. And they're going to be passed to oxygen. See, we're talking about aerobic respiration. They're going to be passed to oxygen, which is the final electron acceptor. And once that occurs, water is produced. Now, there's a lot of things that are also going on in between here. So as the electrons are dropping in free energy, there's transport 
uh, of protons across the gradient, creating this electrochemical gradient. So we're going to talk about that. Now, uh, again, we're talking about the final step in aerobic respiration. We've gone through all of these, and we have the NADH and the FADH2 dropping the electrons off at the electron transport chain and the process of oxidative phosphorylation. And again, this is where the majority of the ATP is produced, about 90% to be specific. Now, let's kind of talk about the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain does is generate uh, ATP indirectly, okay? So and we're going to talk about how it actually does that. Now, um, it does it in steps. And remember, we talked about the difference between doing all of this in one step versus doing this in, in a, a, a series of small steps. And the series of small steps are represented by the passing of the electrons from the higher energy level to the lower energy level in between these protein complexes that are embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So again, the electrons are gonna be passed slowly from one complex to another, from high energy level to a lower energy level, ultimately to oxygen producing water. Okay, so let's look at this process. Look, we've got free energy. Here we've got NADH passing the electrons off to complex one in the mitochondrion. Then FAGH2, or at the same time, FADH2 drops its electrons off at complex two in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. There are four complexes which involve iron sulfur clusters, uh, uh, cytochromes, right? So this is where the electrons, the electrons are going to be passed between these uh, these. Uh, components within these multi-protein complexes. And again, it's moving from higher energy level to lower energy levels. So this is an exergonic process, okay? Energy is released during this process and it's done in a stepwise fashion in order to be more efficient. And this is to prevent the loss of energy to heat or to the environment. So then the electrons get passed to oxygen which is the final electron acceptor in aerobic respiration, and then this produces water. Okay, so that kind of gives an overview in describing the stepwise fashion in which the electron transport chain works. Now let's talk about the little details that are happening in between. Right, so we're going to move to this figure right here, which might seem a little bit busy, but it'll make more sense once we go through it. Okay, so starting from the beginning, we have uh, NADH and FADH2 that came from all of those processes before. Remember, they're carrying electrons. Well, they're going to drop off the electrons. Again, NADH drops its electrons off at complex one. FADH drops its electrons off at complex two. Then they become reoxidized. So remember, they were reduced, right? when they had the electrons, now they're oxidized. So now we have NAD plus and FAD, which we're gonna kind of go back to those other processes and go get some more electrons and then bring them back. Okay, so they're just kind of delivering electrons. Now, um, as the electrons are moving from complex one to complex two to three to four, remember they're moving from high energy level to lower energy level, even though it doesn't actually show it here. In terms of energy, it doesn't mean just because, you know, the membrane is lower here, then that means the energy is lower, okay? That doesn't, it's not that way. Now, what happens as they're passing these electrons, as the electrons are being passed between the complexes is protons are being pumped from the matrix, which is the inside of the intermembrane, so that liquid substance, remember that, matrix to the intermembrane space. Remember the intermembrane space is that space between the two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So you can see there's uh, protons being pumped from the inside to the in-between space or the intermembrane space. So this is gonna build up a proton gradient in the intermembrane space. At the same time, there's an electrical gradient or potential being generated, right? So uh, the inside's gonna be more negative than the outside. Now, this is going to be building up the proton motive force. Okay, so these protons, this is building this chemical gradient, right? The only way the protons can go back in and to become at equilibrium, to go back into the, the matrix is via one way. Okay, so they can't go back through these pumps. 
This is moving them against the concentration gradient. They don't go back in through the pumps. So what's going to ultimately happen is we've got this, this proton gradient being built. The electrons are going to be passed through complex four, ultimately out of complex four, to uh, combining with hydrogen and water to make, or in oxygen to make water. Okay, so this is the electron transport chain. The other part, okay, which is chemiosmosis, is going to use this proton motive force, right, this chemical gradient that's being built by the passing of the electrons between the complexes and the pumping of the protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Now you can see it's building up here. The only way they can go back to the matrix is through this protein complex. It's an enzyme. It's called ATP synthase. Okay, so as they're moving through this, this uh, and we'll, we'll see an example of it later, but this is going to, this part is going to kind of spin around like a, it's like a rotor, right? It's going to spin around and there's a bunch of proteins that are going to bind to ADP and combine the ADP with inorganic phosphate to make ATP. This is chemiosmosis. So let's look at uh, chemiosmosis in, in general, okay? So uh, again, we have protons that are going, that were pumped in this, this gradient that was built in the intermembrane space, right? They are, they're pumped against their concentration gradient. Now they're gonna go down their concentration gradient back through the um, ATP synthase protein complex. As they pass through the protein complex, ATP synthase is going to build ATP. Right, so this is basically what it looks like. We've got the intermembrane space up here, which has the chemical gradient. So this is where all the protons are. The protons are gonna, the only way they can go is through this, right? So here we've got this rotor, which is going to uh, collect all these uh, hydrogen ions. They're gonna be uh, passed down their concentration gradient back into the matrix. And then um, we've got all these proteins right here. They're going to be combining ADP with inorganic phosphate to make ATP. Okay, so this is that, that ATP synthesis. This is, this is the chemiosmosis, the second phase of oxidative phosphorylation. Let's look at uh, the way... All right, so let's look at this protein. This, this kind of shows like a space failing model of it moving. So, okay, so let's put it together. So if we remember, we've got um, the, the uh, electrons, which are carried by the NADH and the FADH2. They're gonna be dropped off at protein complex one and complex two. The, the electrons are going to move from a high energy level to a low energy level through these protein complexes until they're passed to oxygen with the protons that are in the matrix to make water. Now, how do the protons get in the matrix if they are being pumped out of the matrix into the intermembrane space? Well, they're going to come back. So they're being pumped against their concentration gradient to build up this proton motive force which then is gonna be used to drive the production of ATP. So we've got this force right here. The only way they can get back into the matrix is through ATP synthase. And as they're being pushed through ATP synthase by their concentration gradient, it's gonna uh, create this mechanical force, right? The proton motor force um, to create uh, or to combine NA or ADP plus anorganic phosphate to ATP. Okay, so we have these two, two phases of oxidative phosphorylation. We have the electron transport chain and we have the chemiosmosis. They're linked ultimately by this proton motive force that is generated from the transport of the electrons through the protein complexes. And then, of course, the proton motive force um, makes ATP synthase work. Okay, so it's, it's a, more of a mechanical thing. And then all this ATP, about 90% of the Okay, so let's account for uh, how much ATP is actually made during aerobic respiration. 
All right, so in general, the energy is going to flow from the glucose molecule. So again, from glucose, the energy is extracted and um, the ATP is going to be made from the breakdown of this glucose. It's going to flow from glucose. The electrons are going to be pulled from glucose and then combined with NADH and, of course, FADH2, which are electron carriers, which are then are going to carry the electrons to the electron transport chain, which um, are going to be passed between those complexes in the electron transport chain, generating the proton motive force. And it's a proton motive force that drives the production of ATP. Now, how much ATP is actually made during this process? And how much ATP, uh, what type of energy are we dealing with in terms of glucose? So the energy that the potential molecule, so remember glucose is a potential energy, the energy that, it, that we get out of it, basically one glucose molecule, we only get about 34% of the potential energy that this glucose molecule is, is, uh, is kind of holding on to, right? So we have about 32 ATP that are going to be produced during aerobic respiration. And it's about 32 ATP. It's not an exact number. We're going to talk about why. Now, the rest of it is lost as heat. So that's, that's quite a bit lost as heat during this whole process. Now, fats provide a lot more energy. Okay, so you can get a lot more ATPs from, from fat glucose. Now, um, let's, let's talk about uh, why we only actually get this much uh, energy or ATP out of the glucose molecule. Now, some of it's lost as heat during the process of moving, right? So we have um, the kinetic energy. And so remember in glycolysis, right? So gl during glycolysis, this happens outside of the mitochondrion. So that's a little ways away. There's two membranes that are separating um, this NADH from, you know, the oxidative phosphorylation step where the ATP is actually made. So um, it takes a little bit of energy to move the NADH. And then, of course, the FADH2 is going to need some energy to get to oxidative phosphorylation. However, um, at the glycolysis step, two membranes, the mitochondrial membranes, must be passed by this NADH. So here, once we're in the mitochondrion, we have the NADH that's produced from pyruvate oxidation, and then the NADH that's produced from the citric acid cycle, and the FADH2. Again, these must be transported and moved in some way to the oxidative phosphorylation step, which again takes a, some energy. Okay, so ultimately, um, Aside from the four ATP that were made by substrate level phosphorylation, about 26 to 28 ATP are made from oxidative phosphorylation. So it's quite a bit more. However, it's not an exact number. Now, um, the, the maximum, again, when you add it all together, is going to be about 30 to 32 ATP. So remember, adding that four ATP from substrate level phosphorylation to the 26 to 28 from oxidative phosphorylation, we get about 30 to 32 ATP. So let's talk about why it's not an exact number. Now, there are several reasons why we do not know the exact amount of ATP that is made during aerobic respiration. So two of them are the following. Okay, so oxidative phosphorylation, um, also phos photophosphorylation. So oxidative phosphorylation is very similar to photophosphorylation. We haven't talked about photophosphorylation yet, but it will be discussed in uh, chapter 10 when we talk about photosynthesis. But it's really the same thing, except uh, instead of the energy coming from a food molecule, the energy is coming from light. Now, um, the oxidative phosphorylation or photophosphorylation, the, the reactions between and the re redox reactions are not directly coupled. Okay, so the NADH to the ATP ratio is not a whole number. So NADH can produce about um, 2.5 ATPs relatively. And then the FADH2 is about 1.5. Okay, so it's it's not a it's not a whole number. And then um, ATP, the amount of ATP that's produced can vary, and it depends on whether electrons are passed um, to NADH or FAD um, in the mitochondrial matrix or in the cytoplasm. So remember, like I said, if it's in the cytoplasm, the NADH must cross those two membranes, which takes a little bit of energy to get to oxidative phosphorylation.
And then um, the proton motive force is also used to drive other types of work. So it's not only dedicated to producing ATP. The proton motive force is used to do other things as well. Okay, so there's some energy that's not uh, directly related to the production of ATP. Okay, so going back to this right here, this is really a summary of everything, right? So we have glycolysis in the cytosol. If oxygen is absent, then fermentation will occur. Okay, so only two ATP per cycle will be produced. And remember, glycolysis is required for fermentation, alcohol fermentation, and lactic acid fermentation, and aerobic respira anaerobic respiration, and of course, aerobic respiration, which is what is shown here. So if oxygen is present, pruvate will enter the mitochondria and become oxidized to acetyl-CoA, where some carbon dioxide will be released. And then both those acetyl-CoA's from the two pyruvates will enter the citric acid cycle and then com be completely broken down. So during this process, the other four carbon dioxides are released. At this point, there's no more glucose molecule. And again, we make another two ATP during this process, one for each cycle of the citric acid cycle. During both of these processes, including pyruvate oxidation, NADH and FADH2, are going to hold on to those electrons and then they're going to just basically deliver them to the electron transport chain in oxidative phosphorylation step and then the proton motive force will be generated and chemiosmosis will be driven to produce the majority of the ATP. All right, so this kind of summarizes aerobic respiration. Here, remember, we have glucose um, is split into two pyruvate molecules uh, during glycolysis, producing two ATP by substrate level phosphorylation and two NADHs. And then we have the citric acid cycle, but uh, pyruvate must be converted to acetyl-CoA during this process. Two more NADHs are produced, and then uh, the two acetyl-CoAs will enter the citric acid cycle, producing, um, ultimately this is combining right here, the outputs from uh, pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle, we have two ATP that are made by a substrate level phosphorylation. All six carbon dioxide carbons from glucose will be released as carbon dioxide, and eight NADHs total will be produced, and at two FADH2s will be produced, and these will carry the electrons to oxidative phosphorylation, which uh, the first step is the uh, electron transport chain. So the electrons will be passed through the complexes, generating this proton gradient or the proton motive force by pumping the protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. And then this will drive uh, ATP synthase as the protons are being forced back through uh, to the matrix uh, to produce ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. So I talked about um, oxidative phosphorylation, and we accounted for the ATP and why some, why uh, some of the ATP, uh, why we don't have an exact number of the ATP, right? So some energy is actually used to do other things rather than just make ATP. All right, thank you for listening.